Dead America, Tales from New York, The Brooklyn Bodega, by Derek Slayton. Chapter 1, Day 0 plus 5. As the sun peeked over the horizon, John found himself already wide awake. The 17-year-old, a promising football star, perched on the windowsill, one foot inside and the other on the fire escape. Despite the chill in the air, he paid it no heed. The past few days had tested John's resilience. He had watched his mother transform into one of those abominable creatures, tearing into his father with savage ferocity. Left alone to grapple with the horror of it all, John struggled to come to terms with the nightmare that had engulfed his family. Try as he might, John couldn't banish the haunting image of himself wielding a bookend, delivering a fatal blow to his own mother as she lunged at him, consumed by a monstrous hunger. But the anguish of dispatching his father was even more agonizing. Their bond, once unbreakable, now ended with a single blow. Perched atop the fourth floor fire escape, with nothing but the open sky above him, John struggled to contain his emotions as he replayed the harrowing scene in his mind. Blinking back tears, he finally forced himself to shake off the haunting memory, his reverie interrupted by the eerie moans emanating from the street below. Glancing downward, John's gaze fell upon the desolate sight of the once bustling thoroughfare, now transformed into a bleak tableau of despair. The relentless presence of those monstrous creatures had overrun his neighborhood, their numbers multiplying with each passing day. Though he found solace within the confines of his apartment, he knew all too well that this fragile sanctuary could not endure indefinitely. The looming threat outside his window served as a stark reminder that his safety was on a clock, and it was getting close to midnight. Well, John, he muttered to himself, his own voice breaking the silence, you've indulged in enough self-pity. Others have faced the same trials as you. You're not unique, at least not in that regard. John hoisted himself up onto the fire escape, emerging onto the narrow metal platform that halted just shy of the rooftop. He surveyed the urban landscape stretching out before him, a cluster of buildings huddled tightly together with no breathing room in between. To his left stood a towering structure, seven stories high, its facade devoid of windows facing his direction. On his right loomed a three-story building, its rooftop tantalizingly accessible. Yet, there lay a complication. In the initial hours of the outbreak, a handful of survivors sought sanctuary on that very rooftop, unaware that infected individuals were in their ranks. As daylight waned on that fateful day, the entire group had turned into zombies, either by the virus or by the bites of the turned. In John's building, the survivors had taken precautions by barricading the windows that overlooked the rooftop. Despite their efforts, the incessant pounding of a dozen zombies against the wooden planks made sleep a rare commodity on some nights. Retreating back into the two-bedroom apartment, John made a beeline for the kitchen as hunger gnawed at his insides. It was clear early on that nobody was coming to help, at least not in the short term, and stretching the food was essential if they were going to survive. John reached for a glass on the countertop, inspecting it before taking a gulp. With a sigh, he addressed the inanimate object, his tone tinged with a hint of desperation. Okay, come on now, please be nice. John held his breath, anticipation coursing through him as he raised the lever on the faucet. His relief was palpable as water began to flow, filling the glass to the brim. He set it down on the counter, joining the multitude of other glasses he had filled. John had a habit of ensuring that anything capable of holding water was utilized to its fullest extent. Surveying the contents of the cabinets, John's disappointment was evident at the scant selection of food. Four small piles greeted him, each adorned with a taped-up note indicating its intended mealtime. Well, it's better than nothing, I suppose, John muttered to himself. Reaching for the breakfast pile, he unwrapped a small danish from its plastic packaging. With each bite, he savored the fleeting taste, casting a longing glance towards his lunch provisions. Instant noodles and a pack of crackers awaited him, a far cry from the meals he had grown accustomed to. I guess this is what college would have felt like, John mused. A chuckle escaped John's lips as he polished off his breakfast before making his way to the bedroom to prepare for the day ahead. His attire was nothing extravagant, just jeans, a pullover, and a sturdy pair of work boots. There was no one to impress in their small building, but there was plenty of work awaiting him that morning. As he completed his routine, he paused to meet his own gaze in the mirror. There was a momentary hesitation, 
as if he needed to reaffirm to himself the harsh reality of their situation and steel his resolve to accept it. However, his introspection was abruptly interrupted by a sharp knock at the door. Okay, here we go, John muttered to himself, striding towards the front door and swinging it open to reveal Elliot standing there, baseball bat in hand. The 33-year-old banker, his face etched with discomfort, awkwardly balanced himself on the boot of his injured foot. Morning, Elliot. How's the foot feeling today? John inquired. Elliot grimaced, his response tinged with pain. It hurts like hell, but at least I know it's still connected. So it could be worse. John chuckled softly as he closed the door behind them, the sound echoing faintly in the hallway. Together, they proceeded down the narrow corridor, passing three other doors leading to separate apartments. Although the building boasted four stories, the uppermost three levels accommodated just four apartments each, while the ground floor housed the lobby and common areas. You spoken to anyone else today? John inquired, breaking the silence as they walked. Elliot shook his head. No, not yet. I know you're an early riser like me. Thought I'd catch you and we could do our rounds before checking if anyone else is up. Seems fair, John replied with a shrug. Let them sleep in. Not like anyone's got anywhere to be today. Elliot nodded in agreement. True, but someone's going to have to start venturing out soon. Yeah, I know. John muttered. Once I finish my Danish tomorrow morning, I'm officially out of food. It's crazy how quickly we've run through our supplies. Barely been a week, Elliot remarked. Twelve units in the building, three under renovation. Those four empty ones we found looked like they belonged to bankers like you, living off takeout. Doesn't take long to exhaust what you didn't have to begin with, John remarked wryly. Elliot nodded. Yeah, my job didn't exactly leave much time for cooking, or eating for that matter. Elliot paused, his expression distant as he reflected on his former life. Jesus, I was working 16-hour days trying to cram 26 hours of work into one. It's kind of funny that it took the apocalypse for me to gain some perspective on how bad my life was, he said. John nodded in understanding. Worst thing I had to worry about was an English test and the coach breathing down our necks because we got our asses kicked by our rivals last week. Elliot chuckled ruefully. Well, if school ever does come back, make sure you don't work too hard at it. Why not? John inquired, genuinely curious. Because I worked hard in school and look where it got me, Elliot quipped, the bitterness evident in his laughter. Both men shared a moment of camaraderie, their laughter echoing in the stairwell as they descended to the ground floor. However, their levity was short-lived as they emerged from the stairwell greeted by the ominous sound of banging and moaning emanating from the front door. A shiver ran down their spines at the chilling sound. I'm not sure I'm ever going to get used to that sound, Elliot admitted. Approaching the fortified front door, encompassing the entire expanse of windows at the building's facade, John and Elliot spotted Lily. The 23-year-old blonde bartender was seated at the front desk, her feet resting on its surface as she delved into a book. Good morning, Lily. How are things shaping up this morning? John said. Lily held up a single finger, absorbed in the climax of her reading. Moments later, she set the book down, apologizing for the interruption. Sorry, it was an intense scene. Needed to finish it, she explained, her voice carrying a hint of excitement. Elliot couldn't help but smirk as he gestured towards the makeshift barricade at the front of the building, a jumble of wood and furniture cobbled together for protection. Isn't that intense enough for you? He quipped. Lily shook her head dismissively. It's boring, just pointless banging. I'm a sucker for a good murder mystery. There's nothing like the tension of wondering if the person next to you in the elevator is the killer or not. Elliot pondered her words for a moment before conceding with a shrug. So nothing of consequence overnight? John inquired, shifting the conversation back to business. Lily leaned back in her chair, considering the question before responding. The barricade is fine. I think those things outside are starting to lose interest in the building since it's locked up tight and we don't really make a lot of noise down here, she reported. Elliot nodded, absorbing the information before posing another query. Any updates from the walkie-talkie, he asked. Lily nodded as she picked it up. 
Leon up on two called down around two in the morning to check if I needed anything. And Miss Donna up on three just called down about 20 minutes ago, asking for you guys to stop by on your rounds, Lily said. We'll head up there now, John confirmed. And if you can give me 20 minutes or so, I can relieve you so you can get some sleep, Elliot offered. Take your time, Elliot. I still have three chapters left, and I'm going to finish it up before I go to bed anyway, Lily replied with a reassuring smile. As John and Elliot began to walk away, John paused, a lingering concern on his mind. How are you doing on food? He inquired, his tone laced with genuine concern. I got too engrossed in my book and forgot to eat lunch, so I can probably get through tomorrow before I start starving, Lily confessed, her casual tone belying the seriousness of their situation. With a nod of understanding, John and Elliot made their way to the staircase, ascending to the third floor. As they entered the hallway, their gaze shifted to the barricaded windows that bordered the neighboring building's rooftop. Despite the reinforced defenses against the rooftop zombies, an additional barricade had been erected in the hallway as a precaution, fashioned from furniture and wooden stakes. As they approached the apartment at the far end of the hallway, faint moans drifted through the air from the other side of the barrier. Giving a light knock, they waited until a frail voice called out from within. Come on in, boys, Miss Donna beckoned, her elderly voice carrying a sense of warmth and familiarity. Elliot and John stepped inside, closing the door gently behind them. In the kitchen, they found Miss Donna, a sprightly elderly black woman in her seventies, her graying hair a testament to her years. Despite her age, she moved with a surprising agility. Good morning, Miss Donna, John greeted warmly. Good morning, John Elliot. Would you boys like some tea? Miss Donna offered kindly. John declined with a shake of his head, while Elliot accepted with a grateful nod. I would love some, thank you, he replied. As Miss Donna busied herself with their cups, John's attention was drawn to the wide open window leading to the fire escape. Were you planning on going for a walk today, Miss Donna? He inquired curiously. Oh no, my old bones ain't taking me anywhere, Miss Donna chuckled. But I think you should step out there and take a look across the street. John and Elliot exchanged a puzzled glance before making their way to the window. Stepping out onto the fire escape, they found themselves a floor below John's window, overlooking the street. What are we looking for, Miss Donna? Elliot asked, scanning the surroundings. You'll know it when you see it, Miss Donna replied cryptically. The two men peered down at the street, their gazes sweeping over the multitude of undead figures strewn about. Their attention then shifted to the apartment building across the street. Holy shit, Elliot exclaimed. Language Elliot, Miss Donna chided gently. Sorry, Miss Donna, Elliot apologized sheepishly. They continued to stare across the street, their focus drawn to the window of the neighboring apartment. Inside, a woman in her thirties stood, waving as she sipped from a cup. Where the hell did she come from? I haven't seen anybody in that building since this all began, John remarked, his voice tinged with disbelief. Neither have I. I thought they were all dead over there, Elliot added, his confusion mirroring John's. As they peered closer, they noticed a lifeless body lying just a few yards away from the woman. Suddenly, she opened the window and stepped out onto the fire escape. Good morning, fellas. I'm Morgan. Chapter 2 Elliot and John stood dumbfounded on the fire escape, their gaze fixed across the street at Morgan, who mirrored their bewilderment from the adjacent building's fire escape. The awkward silence stretched as they struggled to process the unexpected encounter. Finally, Miss Donna emerged, breaking the tension by handing Elliot his cup of tea. Well, don't be rude. Say hello. She ain't gonna bite, Miss Donna chided gently. Hello, Morgan. I'm John. And this is Elliot, John offered, breaking the silence. Good morning, Elliot added, his voice hesitant. Morgan responded with a wry smile. Oh, the famous John. Miss Donna has been talking up a storm about you this morning. John glanced back at Miss Donna, who beamed with mischief. I thought she was cute, so I thought I would help you out, young fella, she teased, giving John a playful wink that elicited a laugh from him. 
Even amidst the apocalypse, Miss Donna remained determined to play matchmaker. So, Morgan, how's it going over there? John inquired. Morgan shrugged casually. Oh, you know, just engaging in my favorite morning routine of sitting on the stoop and having a cup of coffee. How about you, John? Just making the morning rounds, making sure we're still locked down tight, John replied, his tone more serious. And are you? Morgan probed. Nothing's getting in. At least through the front door, John asserted confidently. Morgan raised an eyebrow, her gaze shifting to the zombie-filled roof. What about those third-floor windows? She asked. Morgan gestured towards the roof of the neighboring building where zombies still roamed, some of them turning their attention towards her due to the noise. That's locked up tight, too, John replied confidently. Proactive, I like that in a man, Morgan remarked, a hint of admiration in her tone. John blushed slightly but maintained his composure. So where did you come from? John asked. A small town in Iowa that I would be shocked and amazed if you've heard of, Morgan replied, her voice tinged with humor. John and Elliot shared a brief laugh before John clarified his question. I was referring to more recent times, John said. Morgan nodded understandingly. Oh, you mean how did I find myself in the apartment across from you in the middle of the apocalypse? Something like that, John confirmed. Morgan proceeded to recount her story. Well, I had a date the night all of this nonsense started. It went well, and we ended up back at his place, which I believe was a couple of floors up and on the other side of the building. Anyway, it doesn't matter at this point. What does matter is that he got up early and left for work, and never made it back. So I've been bouncing around the apartments here, scrounging for food, which sadly, there just isn't a lot of. New renovations. So lots of great-looking apartments, but not a lot of tenants. That's rough, John sympathized. It is what it is. Now let me ask you, John, how are you doing on the food front over there? Morgan inquired. I'm afraid we're running a little low, or else I'd invite you over for dinner, John said. Morgan couldn't help but crack a smile as she observed the younger John's attempts at flirting with her. That's very kind of you, John. But do you mind if I ask you something? Morgan inquired. Go right ahead, Morgan, John replied, curious about her question. If you're running low on food, then why haven't you made a play for that bodega on the corner of your block? Morgan pointed out, gesturing towards the nearby bodega, which was surrounded by a mass of zombies. John glanced down the street at the bodega, considering Morgan's suggestion. If I'm being honest, we thought the owner was still in there and might not like us raiding his store. Oh, he is in there, John, he very much is. But I don't think he's going to mind you visiting his store, Morgan revealed calmly. John looked surprised. Are you sure? I have a clear view into the store, and he's one of those things, Morgan confirmed. Well, that's good, I mean, not for him. But that leaves us with a bit of a problem, John admitted. Getting there? Morgan guessed. Yep, there's a roof full of those things. God only knows what's in the building beside it, and then figuring out how to get into his building. Because from my vantage point, it doesn't look like the front door is an option, John explained. The things on the roof shouldn't be a problem. And getting into his apartment isn't a big deal. There should be a fire escape on the other side of the building which leaves that tall middle building. Surely you have the manpower to go through that, don't you? Morgan suggested. Not really. Elliot here can barely walk, and the only other person who could do something is Leon. But he's so banged up from his day job he'd be more of a liability than anything. Just don't tell him I said that, John admitted with a chuckle. Morgan laughed and nodded in response. Don't worry, John, your secret is safe with me, Morgan said. I appreciate that. John acknowledged. Well, what if I made you a deal, John? Morgan proposed. I'm listening, John responded, intrigued. What if I came over and helped you get to that bodega? What could you give me in return? Morgan offered. We have three empty apartments that are furnished, so you could have your pick of those, and your share of the food. Because I have people like Miss Donna here to take care of, so everybody gets an equal share, John proposed. That's noble, I like that. 
you seem like you have a good head on your shoulders. And I agree to your terms, Morgan accepted, her enthusiasm evident. John and Elliot exchanged a curious glance, uncertain about Morgan's eagerness. I appreciate your enthusiasm and the offer for help. But unless you have a set of angel wings on you, I'm not sure how you plan on getting over to us, John remarked skeptically. Morgan stood tall on the fire escape, flashing a big grin as she finished her cup of coffee. Without saying a word, she stepped back into the apartment, leaving John and Elliot puzzled. I could be wrong on this, but she seems a little. Off, John remarked to Elliot. Elliot shrugged. I have two ex-wives, so all women seem a little off to me. Miss Donna intervened, delivering a swift smack to Elliot's leg. Boy, I don't care how old you are, you get sassy like that again, and I'll bend you over my knee. Rather than getting defensive, Elliot responded playfully, Oh, don't go threatening me with a good time there, Miss Donna. Unless you want to be my third ex-wife. Elliot responded with a playful wink, causing Miss Donna to burst into laughter before delivering another smack. I got my eye on you, boy, Miss Donna warned, though her tone was lighthearted. Elliot simply smiled and nodded, his attention redirected by John's tap. As they turned around, they spotted Morgan re-emerging onto the fire escape, this time with a long length of mountain climbing rope in hand. Now, Miss Donna said you played football. What position did you play? Morgan inquired. Linebacker. But I played a little tight end when we were down at the goal line, John answered. Tight end, huh? So you've got good hands, Morgan remarked, sizing him up. Not good enough for the college scouts, but good enough in a pinch, John admitted modestly. Morgan gestured toward the sea of zombies below them. I think this qualifies as a pinch. With a couple of metal hooks, Morgan snapped them onto one end of the rope, adding weight to it. When I send this your way, I'm going to need you to catch it for me. Can you do that? She asked. Absolutely, just let me get down to the second floor. Just in case it starts dropping, John replied. Good idea, Morgan agreed. Elliot, get ready to catch that if it goes high, John instructed. He nodded as John descended down to the second floor fire escape. As he reached the landing, John knocked on the window, catching Leon's attention. The heavyset 50-year-old contractor waved back from his recliner, motioning for John to open the window. Morning, John. You know you can use the front door, right? Leon greeted, his voice slightly muffled through the glass. Have you not heard us talking? John replied with a chuckle. Thirty years in construction has left me half deaf. You're lucky I can hear you right now, Leon joked, getting up from his seat and moving closer to the window. We have a friend across the street who is going to come over, John explained. Leon looked confused but intrigued positioning himself by the window to get a better view outside. Okay, Morgan, send it my way. John called out, signaling to Morgan across the street. Get ready, here it comes. Morgan responded. Morgan steadied herself at the edge of the fire escape railing, gripping the climbing line firmly. With a practiced motion, she began to swing it around and around. As it reached the right position, she released her hold, sending the weighted line flying through the air towards John's waiting hands. John's eyes followed the shiny metal projectile as it soared through the air, tracing its trajectory and mentally anchoring the line behind it. However, the throw proved a tad high, resulting in a clang as it struck the railing just above him, deflecting out towards the street. Reacting swiftly, John wasted no time, lunging forward over the railing. With one arm, he secured a grip on the ladder, while reaching out as far as possible with the other. Behind him, he could hear curses emanating from Leon, who watched intently from the window. John's risky move paid off as he managed to steady himself while snatching the rope before it plummeted to the ground below. With a quick motion, he pulled himself back to the safety of the fire escape, much to the dismay of the zombies below, whose frustrated groans echoed in the air. Nice catch there, John. Those college scouts were full of shit, Morgan quipped. John couldn't help but crack a smile as he utilized the metal fasteners to secure the line to the fire escape. Though it wasn't much of an incline, the rope hung at a decent angle. Once Morgan secured her end, the rope became taut with tension. Okay, I'm going to send down my bag first. 
The handle has a latch you can take off, Morgan instructed, preparing to lower her belongings. Send it on over, John replied eagerly. Morgan attached a large purse to the line, giving it a firm shove that managed to carry it across the street. John carefully inspected the contents as he retrieved it, noting the presence of food and other essential items. Okay, I'm next, Morgan announced, preparing herself for the descent. Be careful, John cautioned. Morgan nodded in acknowledgement as she climbed onto the rope, positioning her legs on it first before sliding down and gripping it firmly. John couldn't help but be impressed by her strength and agility as she quickly shimmied down the line, making her way towards him with confidence. As Morgan landed safely on the fire escape, the zombies below reached up, their moans sounding oddly excited, as if they were rooting for her to drop. Strangely, their continued moans seemed tinged with disappointment as she landed securely. Straightening up, Morgan stretched out her back and shoulders before extending her hand for a shake. It's good to meet you face to face, John, she greeted warmly. Likewise, Morgan. I gotta say, I didn't expect company when I woke up today, John replied with a chuckle, still somewhat bemused by the unexpected turn of events. Yeah, neither did I, Leon chimed in from the window, his tone a mix of surprise and amusement. John turned to Morgan, pointing up to Leon. I'm sorry, Morgan, this is Leon. It's a pleasure. Leon greeted politely, offering a nod of acknowledgement. Morgan nodded in appreciation before glancing up at Elliot and Miss Donna, who poked her head out of the window. Why don't you two come up here, and I'll make some fresh biscuits? Miss Donna offered warmly. You got one for me too? Leon chimed in from his perch by the window. Yeah, come on, Leon. Seems rude to leave you out too, Miss Donna replied with a chuckle. I'll take one down to Lily when they're ready. I have to take her post anyway, Elliot volunteered. Actually, call her up here, Elliot. The front will be fine for a few minutes. We need to talk about the bodega. Chapter 3 The atmosphere in Miss Donna's kitchen was thick with tension as Leon voiced his disbelief. You people are out of your minds, he exclaimed. John responded with a hint of sarcasm. Tell us how you really feel, Leon. Around the table, Elliot, Morgan, Lily, and Miss Donna sat quietly, their attention fixed on their biscuits, while Leon and John exchanged words. You really want to go out there with those things? Leon's concern was evident. John's response was measured, tinged with resignation. No, I don't, Leon, but we don't have any other choice. I'm not sure if you've been paying attention, but we really don't have a lot of food left. Elliot chimed in. It's been days since we've heard anything on the radio. Nobody was on the television either when the power went down. Lily added grimly, so it's a safe bet that we're on our own. Which means if we don't help ourselves, nobody will. Leon sat there, visibly frustrated. His anger wasn't directed at the people around the table, it was directed at their predicament. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think I'm going to be able to go out there, Leon confessed, his breath labored. Walking down those stairs winded me. I'm not trying to bitch out or anything, but I'd be more of a liability than anything. It's okay, Leon. We weren't going to ask you to. You're the only person in this place that knows how to fix anything, so we'd be foolish to risk having you go out, John said. Leon paused, considering John's words before offering a wry smile. I know you're full of shit, John, but I appreciate you letting me down easy. John acknowledged Leon with a nod before shifting his attention to Morgan. Now the question is, who is going? Other than me, that is. Elliot offered his skills confidently. I can swing a mean bat. But you can't run. Which leaves you out. So it's me or Miss Newcomer here, Lily said. While we're both capable, I feel like I need to earn my place here. So I'll go, Morgan said. Lily, determined to contribute, voiced her willingness. I don't mind going too. I need the food just as much as anybody. You can help us out on the roof, Lily. But three people can get really crowded once we get into that next building. If those hallways are anything like ours, it's going to be a tight fit if we have to fight. John replied. Lily accepted the decision without protest, 
simply nodding in agreement. The group fell silent for a moment, finishing up their biscuits. Okay, let's get prepped, John declared. Leon Elliot, start working on that metal barrier on the window. You want us to open the barricade? Elliot asked. Just loosen it, John instructed. That window should be strong enough to hold up for a few minutes while we get into position. As they embarked on their tasks, John, Morgan, and Lily made their way to the living room, where an assortment of supplies and makeshift weapons awaited them. Strewn across the table were a couple of baseball bats alongside a handful of knives. Additionally, a hard plastic sled with handholds caught their attention. Are we going sledding? Morgan inquired with a hint of amusement. This thing worked like a charm in the hallway when we had to secure it against a few of those things. It's lightweight, hard so they can't get through it, and did a good job of holding them in place so somebody else could strike. John remarked. Thinking outside the box, I like it, Morgan responded, nodding her head approvingly. We're not in the Midwest, where we could just grab guns from the closet, John explained. We had to improvise. Morgan shot him a curious glance, her expression tinged with offense, which John promptly noticed. Do you honestly think everyone in the Midwest has guns in their closet? Morgan challenged, her tone betraying disbelief. If I'm being honest, yeah, I do, John admitted candidly. That's such an ignorant take, John, Morgan retorted, her voice edged with reproach. I'm sorry, Morgan. I didn't mean to offend, John apologized sincerely. Well, you did offend me, John, Morgan asserted firmly, thinking that we all have guns in our closets out there in the Midwest. We love our guns out there, so we have them on display in the living room. We'd never disrespect them by putting them into the closet. A moment of quiet settled in, allowing the weight of the joke to sink in before all three erupted into laughter. You had me going there for a minute, John chuckled. Morgan nodded in agreement. You gotta keep things light while we're faced with the darkness. Come on. John and Lily grabbed baseball bats, while Morgan armed herself with a couple of knives in the sled. Together they strode into the hallway, where Elliot and Leon were busy dismantling the hastily installed metal bars on the window. Elliot stepped back as they approached, offering them a clearer view. They're still pretty spread out over there, but as soon as you go through, they're going to be on you, Elliot warned. Get upstairs and look out the window. Call out what you see when we get out there, John instructed. You got it, John. It'll take me just a minute to get up there, Elliot replied, hurrying off despite his hobbled leg. The group observed as Leon carefully undid the last bolt holding the bars in place. Outside, a lone zombie pressed against the window, as if it had been there for quite some time. Getting past this one is going to be the hardest. I'm going to drive it back with the baseball bat. Pull them over to me while you two get out. Once we're out there, start taking them out any way you can. Shot to the head, or just shoving them over the side of the roof, John strategized. Lily nodded in agreement. Sounds like a plan, John. Morgan stood there for a moment, her gaze fixed on John before she finally spoke. How old are you, John? Morgan inquired. Seventeen. I turn 18 in a couple of weeks if I manage to live that long, John replied matter-of-factly. So in a building filled with adults, everybody is falling in line behind you and letting you take charge. How did you manage that? Morgan questioned further. Because he was the only one who did. My fat ass isn't interested in the job, Elliot's too injured, Miss Donna is too old, and Lily's not too much older than he is. Plus we're five days into this thing and still kicking, and he's putting his ass on the line for us, Leon interjected. Or to put it another way, Morgan, the apocalypse doesn't care about age, Lily added. Fair enough, Morgan conceded. As Leon pulled the last bar down, clearing the path for the trio, they heard Elliot stomping on the floor above, signaling that he was in position. Okay, let's do this, John declared. Leon slid past them, with John assuming the lead position. Gripping the bat tightly, he positioned himself at the bottom of the window, nodding to the others before hoisting it up. As soon as the window was open, the creature outside began thrashing about excitedly. John wasted no time, forcefully shoving the bat into the creature's chest, causing it to stumble backward and collapse to the ground. 
Without hesitation, he darted through the window, swinging the bat downward with all his strength, the blow landing squarely on the zombie's head, cracking its skull upon impact. Behind him, he heard Morgan urgently call out his name, prompting him to spin around. Another zombie lurked beside the window, its gnarled hands clawing at the opening, attempting to gain entry. John rushed over to the zombie by the window, seizing it by the back of its shirt. With a burst of strength, he dragged it away and hurled it to the ground with all his might. Taking a moment to assess the situation, John glanced around and noted that the majority of the zombies on the roof, roughly a dozen or so, had fixated on him and were making their way towards him. Without hesitation, he turned back to the fallen zombie and delivered another powerful blow to its head, ensuring its demise. Come on, get out here. John called out urgently, motioning for the others to join him. John stood his ground, his eyes fixed on the women as they successfully made their way out of the window, with Leon promptly shutting it behind them. In a swift and calculated move, Morgan darted forward towards a trio of zombies near the back of the approaching pack, wielding the sled shield as her weapon of choice. With precision, she knocked one down before swiftly turning her attention to the other two. Meanwhile, Lily pressed ahead, swinging her weapon as hard as she could at the ghoul on the ground, swiftly ending its threat while Morgan kept the other two at bay. Morgan positioned the shield directly into the chest of one of the creatures, effectively immobilizing it as she deftly withdrew her knife and plunged it into the zombie's head, swiftly dispatching it. As John found himself backed into a corner, his gaze shifted to the mob of creatures closing in on him, forming what seemed like an impenetrable wall of rotting flesh. The right side is weak. Elliot yelled from above. John's gaze snapped to Elliot, who was shouting and gesturing towards the right. Without a moment's hesitation, he shifted into linebacker mode, sprinting at full tilt towards the line of zombies. Lowering his shoulder, John barreled through the undead horde, sending a couple of them crashing to the ground as he pushed his way through to the back of their ranks. The impact caused the bat to be knocked from his hand, but instead of retrieving it, he pivoted towards the nearest ghoul, its arms outstretched in a grotesque attempt to grab him. Seizing the creature by the wrist, John yanked it past him before grasping its shirt from behind and forcefully shoving it towards the edge of the roof. The zombie teetered on the brink for a fleeting moment, its movements too uncoordinated to prevent its inevitable plunge over the side and down to the ground below. John swiftly retrieved his bat, forcefully swinging it upwards and connecting with the face of one of the fallen zombies, snapping its head back with a sickening crack. With another swift motion, he brought the bat down, ending the unlife of the second fallen ghoul. Retreating back to the women, John watched as Morgan employed the hold and stab technique that had proved effective earlier, while Lily continued to crack skulls with her bat. As the trio backed up a few steps, they found themselves facing half a dozen zombies still standing, all of them advancing shoulder to shoulder in a menacing line. I'll get them to the ground. You finish them off, John declared. We're following your lead, Morgan affirmed. John nodded decisively as he reverted to linebacker mode, charging towards the right side of the zombie line. With forceful momentum, he plowed through two sluggish undead, sending them sprawling to the ground. Swiftly changing direction, John darted to the left, seizing the next zombie by the back of its shirt collar and forcefully yanking it down. Stepping back from the fallen ghoul, he emitted sharp whistles, luring more undead in his direction. Keeping a watchful eye on Morgan and Lily, as they dispatched the ghouls on the ground, John raised his bat high, bringing it crashing down with a resounding thud onto another skull. He backed away steadily, ensuring there was ample space between himself and the other two. Yeah, that's right. Keep your focus on me. It'll make things a lot easier, John taunted, his voice brimming with confidence. John maintained the zombies' attention as Morgan and Lily stealthily approached from behind, dispatching the creatures with efficiency. After the dust settled, the trio stood amidst the aftermath of their battle, surveying the dozen motionless corpses strewn across the roof. John glanced up to Elliot, seeking his assessment. How are we looking, Elliot? John inquired. Everything looks motionless to me, Elliot replied from his vantage point. John let out a sigh of relief, feeling the tension dissipate after the intense confrontation. I can see why everybody follows you. That was some nice work, Morgan complimented, admiration evident in her tone. I'm just glad these things have slowed down. 
If they were still running, I don't think we would have made it. John admitted. Just be careful if you come across a newly turned one. They're still fast, Morgan cautioned. Or you could just do me a favor and not get bitten, John quipped, his words tinged with a touch of humor. John's playful remark elicited a laugh from Morgan, her amusement evident in the sound. I'll get Leon to help me get these things over the edge. It smells bad enough with those things on the street, so we don't need them baking on the roof next to us, Lily declared. We're going to scout the building and figure out our next move, John announced, his gaze shifting towards the taller building adjacent to theirs. Lily nodded in acknowledgement as John and Morgan turned their attention to the looming structure. Multiple windows lined its exterior, all tightly shut. Are you ready? John asked. Let's see what we can see. Chapter 4 Morgan and John strolled along the row of windows, peering into each one. The first window on their right revealed an empty apartment, while the one in the middle offered a grim view of a hallway overrun by zombies. Yeah, I'm not thrilled with that one, John remarked, his gaze fixed on the horde. We're going to have to get into that hallway eventually, Morgan observed. Not necessarily. Come on, let's check out the last one, John suggested, motioning towards the remaining window. Approaching the final window, they found themselves looking into another apartment, its interior occupied by several lurking zombies. Looks like it's the first one, Morgan concluded. Maybe not, John countered, his attention drawn to the window above the hallway. Turning back to Elliot, who remained stationed at the fourth floor hallway window, John called out, Hey Elliot, can you see anything in that hallway? I think I see movement, but it's hard to tell from here, Elliot responded. John paused, contemplating for a moment before stooping to gather a handful of rocks from the rooftop. With a determined flick of his wrist, he hurled them towards the window above. Seconds later, the telltale sight of zombies pressing against the glass confirmed Elliot's earlier assessment. Yeah, that hallway doesn't look good, Elliot confirmed. John shrugged nonchalantly as he turned back to Morgan. Oh well, it was worth a shot. It was good thinking though. Come on, let's see if we can get into that empty apartment, Morgan suggested, pulling out a knife to work on the lock. As they approached the window, John spoke up. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Well, we did just slaughter a dozen of those things together. I suppose that grants you a question, Morgan replied with a hint of amusement. John chuckled before posing his query. Only one? Well, you did take down a fair number of them, so one question and a follow-up. But don't worry, it looks like we have a lot more of those things to take out, so you can earn more, Morgan replied, her tone lightening the tension of their grim surroundings. Amused by her response, John considered his question carefully before asking, so why did you decide to come to New York? And don't say corn or because the Midwest, I'd like a real answer. Have you ever been to the Midwest or seen 50 straight miles of corn? Morgan countered with a wry grin. I can't say that I have, John admitted. Well, if you had, then you'd know that either of those were valid reasons, Morgan retorted. However, since you asked nicely, I'll give you a real answer, Morgan relented, her tone softening. The short answer is that I was young and stupid and followed a man out here. And the long answer? John inquired, his hand instinctively covering his mouth as he realized he'd exhausted his follow-up question. Morgan couldn't suppress a laugh at his predicament. Don't worry, you can ask a real follow-up, she reassured him, her laughter echoing in the tense atmosphere. Thank goodness, John replied with a relieved sigh. But the long answer is that I got married young, like your age young, Morgan began, her voice tinged with reminiscence. It was just what you did when you lived in a small town. As Morgan wrestled with the stubborn lock, she continued her narrative. My ex-husband's uncle was some bigwig at a marketing firm over in Manhattan, and he gave his nephew a job. It was great the first year, because neither of us had ever spent longer than a week outside of the Midwest. We were going out every weekend, seeing shows and experiencing everything we could. Pausing momentarily to grunt in frustration at the lock, Morgan muttered a string of curse words under her breath before continuing. Sorry, this window is being a bitch. Anyway, 
After that first year, he started working late a couple of nights a week. Then a few nights a week. Then every night. And on the weekends. Came to find out that his uncle had taken my ex-husband under his wing and showed him that having money in the city was a great icebreaker for gold diggers. Lucky for me, his uncle had never been married, so he didn't warn my ex-husband about alimony. John couldn't help but chuckle as Morgan finally managed to unlatch the stubborn lock. With a smooth motion, she swung the window open, gesturing for him to enter first. Before he obliged, John turned back to Lily and Leon, who were busy disposing of bodies over the rooftop's edge. Hey gang, we're going in. We're going to shut the window behind us, so if the worst happens, those things shouldn't be able to get out here, John announced, his voice carrying a note of reassurance. You got this, John, Leon affirmed. You too, Morgan, Lily added with a supportive nod. Once inside, they secured the window behind them. Moving silently through the empty apartment, they checked to ensure they were alone before resuming their conversation. So, follow up, John began. Okay, what do you have for me? Morgan replied, her curiosity piqued. If your marriage ended, and I assume everybody you knew was through your husband's job, John paused, choosing his words carefully. Which it was, Morgan confirmed. Why stay in New York? Don't get me wrong, I'm very happy to have you here, especially in this situation. But if you're all alone in the big city, why stay? John inquired, genuine curiosity coloring his tone. Morgan pondered for a moment, recognizing that John's limited life experience might require a different approach to understanding her reasoning. The town I was from had 2,500 people in it. The closest supercenter was an hour away. Up here, there were more people within 50 yards of me than in my hometown. Plus, I had every single thing I could ever want within minutes, she explained, trying to paint a vivid picture for him. But it seemed John was still struggling to grasp the essence of her explanation. Let me put it another way, Morgan continued. If you spent your entire life going to a grocery store that only sold vanilla ice cream, then you found one that had 50 flavors. Would you want to go back to that first store? Finally, understanding dawned on John's face as he nodded in agreement. That makes sense. Although, if that store was selling chocolate, I'm not sure I would have left in the first place, he quipped, eliciting a laugh from Morgan as they approached the front door. John peered out through the peephole, his expression turning somber. That bad? Take a look for yourself, John replied, stepping aside to allow Morgan a view. Morgan joined him at the door exhaling softly as she took in the sight of half a dozen zombies shuffling aimlessly in the hallway. We have the shield, so if we play it right, using the door as a bottleneck, I think we can do it, Morgan suggested. I might have another idea, John interjected, a glimmer of excitement in his eyes. John gestured for Morgan to follow as they made their way to the window at the front of the building. Opening it, he stepped out onto the fire escape, a grin spreading across his face. I think this might work, John remarked. You got an idea? Morgan inquired, stepping out onto the fire escape beside him. Yeah, the fire escape goes all the way to the roof. I guess there's a patio up there or something. But look, there's another one on the far apartments, John explained, pointing to the adjacent fire escape. So we can go up and over, but we still have the same problem as before. Those things in the hallway, Morgan noted. It's a good thing we have friends who can make some noise and draw them this way, John replied, his confidence unwavering. Nodding in agreement, Morgan returned to the apartment and approached the window overlooking the roof. Hey Lily, after you toss your next body over, I need you to come into the apartment and start banging on the door, Morgan called out. Seriously? Won't we risk them breaking through? Lily's voice carried a note of apprehension. You'll be okay. These doors are solid and there are two dead bolts on it. They won't have enough leverage to get through, Morgan reassured her. Where are you two going? Lily asked. Over and around, Morgan replied with a determined smile. Lily nodded in acknowledgement before calling out as Morgan stepped back into the apartment. Morgan. Yeah, Lily? Watch yourselves up top there. I had a friend who lived in that building, and a lot of people loved to go up there, Lily warned, her concern evident. 
Morgan nodded appreciatively as she rejoined John on the fire escape. Up we go. Just don't rush onto the roof. Lily sounded concerned about what we might find, Morgan advised cautiously. Well, I don't want to make her mad. So we'll watch ourselves, John replied. As they ascended towards the roof, they stopped at every window to peer inside. The first apartment they glimpsed housed zombies within. It's crazy to me that so many people didn't even get out of their apartments, Morgan remarked, a tinge of sadness in her voice. It's not all that surprising when you consider, John countered cryptically. Consider what? Morgan inquired, her curiosity piqued. You honestly don't know? John seemed surprised. I have no clue. I woke up in an apartment alone. The news was less than helpful before the power went out. All I know is what I figured out on my own, which is cracking a skull takes these things down for good, Morgan explained. Do you remember just before everything nosedived, those reports of that flu running through the city? John prompted. I vaguely remember. Wasn't it overrunning the hospitals? Morgan recalled. Yeah, it was. Well, my mother was sick. And then on that first night, she took her final breath. Then woke up, John revealed, his words heavy with the weight of that memory. Morgan came to a stop, causing John to halt and peer down at her. There was a flicker of concern in her eyes, as if she feared she had unearthed painful memories for him. I'm so sorry, John. I didn't mean to, Morgan apologized earnestly. Hey, hey, it's okay, Morgan. It's something that I'm going to have to spend years dealing with, assuming I have the years, of course. There's no way you could have known. But yeah, that flu or whatever is what caused all this to happen. So a lot of people went to sleep hoping that they'd feel better in the morning. And then they never woke up, at least not as themselves, John reassured her, his voice steady, despite the weight of his words. Morgan paused, piecing together the implications of John's revelation. She realized that John's mother must have turned into one of those creatures and attacked his father. Rather than delving deeper into the painful subject, she simply nodded in understanding. Well, it's a shame a few more of these people didn't have the common courtesy to start the apocalypse by sleeping over with someone like I did. I left a pantry full of food for whoever breaks into my apartment, Morgan quipped, attempting to lighten the mood. Let's not rule it out, we may have to raid this building eventually. But low-hanging fruit first, John replied. Morgan's laughter caught John off guard. Sorry, I just think it's funny that this is what you consider low-hanging fruit. John chuckled softly as he led them toward the roof. Finally reaching the top rung, they could hear movement and moaning above. Motioning for Morgan to stay put and quiet, John climbed up the ladder, stopping at the top to peek over. The sight of eight creatures gathered around a small picnic area, surrounded by blood, prompted him to let out a sigh. Descending the ladder, he and Morgan conversed in hushed tones. Half a dozen of them near the center of the roof, just kind of hanging out, John reported. Can we just slip by them? Morgan suggested, her voice tinged with concern. Yeah, but then we'd have to deal with them on our way back. They're just going to follow us over to the ladder, John reasoned, his mind working through the options. As John paused, a grin slowly spread across his face, igniting excitement in Morgan's eyes. You got something? She inquired eagerly. Oh yeah, I got something. Chapter 5 Morgan pressed her back firmly against the wall, her gaze fixed on the edge of the roof looming above. Meanwhile, John ascended the ladder, his baseball bat clutched in hand. As he peered over the edge, he stole a glance back at Morgan, signaling his readiness to execute their plan. In response, she flashed him a thumbs up. John swung his bat against the brick-lined edge of the roof, the metallic reverberation slicing through the stillness of the day. In perfect harmony, the creatures perched on the rooftop swilled their attention towards him, their groans filled with anticipation. Yeah, that's right, come on over. Fresh meat ripe for the picking, John taunted, his bravado masking the tension beneath the surface. He cast a fleeting glance downward at Morgan, who was suppressing a laugh. Yeah, well they get the point, John quipped, a wry smile dancing across his lips as he redirected his focus to the advancing horde. With another resounding smack of his bat, he goaded the zombies into hastening their pace. 
As the undead drew nearer, John descended to the landing below, a ten-foot drop separating him from the rooftop's edge. Despite his descent, his gaze remained fixed upward, tracking the zombie's approach with unwavering intensity. Here we go, John muttered under his breath. Both John and Morgan directed their gazes upward as the first zombie reached the edge, halting in its tracks and peering down at them. However, their attention was diverted when one of their companions eagerly jostled to the forefront, causing the lead zombie to lose its footing and tumble over the edge. John and Morgan observed in astonishment as the creature plummeted to the ground below, its impact resonating with a heavy thud. The disturbance caused two more ghouls to lose their balance, following suit over the railing. This is working better than I thought, John remarked, a mixture of satisfaction and surprise coloring his tone. What do we do about the last three? Morgan inquired. Just as she voiced her concern, another zombie stumbled over the edge, its head connecting with the railing before somersaulting onto the road below. And the German judge gives him a 9.6. Morgan quipped, a hint of amusement creeping into her words. That was kind of impressive. John conceded, a chuckle escaping him. But the question still remains. What do we do about the last two? After a brief moment of contemplation, John seized his bat and began ascending the ladder once more. What are you doing? Morgan questioned. Trust me, John replied cryptically. Morgan observed with bated breath as John ascended the ladder, positioning himself just a few rungs above the two zombies teetering at the edge of the roof. The undead duo stood shoulder to shoulder, engaged in a futile struggle as they attempted to align themselves with the ladder. With a calculated maneuver, John extended his arm to the right, using the bat to tap against the wall. The sound caught the attention of one of the zombies, drawing it closer to investigate. As the ghoul leaned forward, John lifted the bat, dangling it enticingly within reach. Come on, take the bait, John urged, his voice laced with anticipation. Responding to his command, the creature extended its arm a fraction further, reaching for the shiny object just beyond its grasp. In its eagerness, it overreached and lost its balance, tumbling over the edge and colliding with several other undead figures on the street below. Okay, one more, John declared. John attempted the trick once more, clanging the bat against the side of the building, but the ghoul remained unmoved. It simply stood there, fixated on John, refusing to take that crucial step forward. Undeterred by the creature's lack of response, John tightened his grip on his bat and climbed a few more rungs, positioning himself near the top, just beyond the creature's reach. Be careful, John. Morgan cautioned. Stand back, John instructed, his tone resolute. Morgan complied, pressing herself against the wall as John maneuvered the bat, wedging it between the legs of the zombie. With a determined effort, he pushed away from the building with all his strength. The force of the shove sent the creature hurtling past John, its flailing arms making contact with his shoulders as it sailed by. The sudden impact caught John off guard, causing him to lose his grip on the bat momentarily, but his reflexes kicked in, allowing him to secure it against his body. As he watched the zombie plummet towards the sidewalk below, John couldn't help but feel a surge of adrenaline coursing through him. Are you okay? Morgan inquired. Yeah, damn thing just smacked me on its way down, John replied, his voice slightly shaken. Scared the hell out of me, but I'm good. John took a moment to steady himself before ascending back to the rooftop summit, cautiously poking his head over the edge to ensure it was clear. Okay, we're good. Let's take in the sights, shall we? He proposed, his tone laced with a hint of grim humor. Morgan nodded in agreement and followed John to the rooftop which towered above the surrounding buildings. Although their view was partially obstructed by neighboring buildings, what lay before them still managed to evoke a sense of awe. Jesus Christ, Morgan muttered under her breath, her gaze fixated on the distant skyline of Manhattan. While they couldn't discern much detail from their vantage point, they could make out several plumes of smoke rising, joining the myriad others scattered across the Brooklyn landscape. I'm not sure what I was expecting to see up here, but this is bleak even by my worst thoughts, John remarked. How close are we to the water? Morgan inquired. Maybe two, three miles to the East River. Probably six or seven miles if we headed south to Coney Island, John estimated. Neither of those sound like they're going to happen, 
Morgan observed. That's a shame, because I'd totally win you a stuffed animal at one of those games, John replied, a sly smile creeping onto his face. Morgan chuckled, giving John's shoulder a friendly pat. Well, at the rate we're moving, if we left now we might be able to celebrate your 18th birthday there, she teased, her laughter ringing out against the desolate backdrop. When we get there, you're buying me my first shot, John countered with a grin. You do know you have to be 21 to drink, right? Morgan pointed out. Lucky for me, there's no police officer in sight, John quipped, his grin widening. Their laughter subsided as they approached the edge of the building, peering down at the bodega situated on the corner below. The two-story structure appeared almost quaint from their elevated vantage point, and to their surprise, the streets seemed less overrun with the undead. Guess they lost interest, John remarked, noting the scattered presence of the creatures below. Could have been because of our skydivers. We have been making quite a racket, Morgan suggested. That's a good point. Come on, let's start heading down to the third floor, John said. The two of them began their descent down the fire escape, their eyes darting through the windows of the apartments they passed. Like their ascent on the opposite side of the building, the dwellings fell into one of two categories, either completely abandoned units or occupied by the undead. Finally reaching the third floor fire escape, they touched down on the landing only to be greeted by a group of zombies emerging from the adjacent apartment. Both of them watched in grim silence as a family of four inside the apartment smeared blood on the windows, their futile attempts to break through thwarted by the sturdy glass. The fourth floor was open, Morgan observed and also had the hallway of doom, John reminded her. Hopefully Lily is making enough noise on the apartment door that it's pulled them away, Morgan said. One way to find out, John agreed. They retraced their steps back up to the fourth floor apartment, methodically clearing the space to ensure it was safe. Approaching the door, they peered through the peephole, spotting a couple of zombies lingering in the hallway beyond. Could be worse, I guess John remarked. It does look a lot better than the other side. So how do you want to play it? Morgan inquired. I'm going to take the sled shield, force my way out, and pin them against the wall. Then you come over the top with the knives and put them down, John said. Morgan pondered the situation for a moment, her gaze fixed on the zombies lingering outside the door. Eventually, she shook her head, her expression filled with uncertainty. It's too dangerous, she asserted. We still need to do it, though, John insisted. No, we have to do something. Not necessarily that, though, Morgan countered, a flicker of mischief dancing in her eyes. John regarded her with curiosity as a smile spread across her face. Okay, let's see what you can come up with, he agreed. Moments later, John stood by the door, his hands empty, while Morgan positioned herself with one hand on the doorknob and the other clutching a knife. Are you ready? Morgan inquired. Let's do it, John affirmed. Morgan glanced through the peephole before swiftly pulling the door open. In a split second, John darted into the hallway, seizing the zombie by the arm and hurling it back into the apartment. The creature crashed to the floor, disoriented and thrashing about, as Morgan quietly shut the door behind them. With the door secured, she handed John the knife who wasted no time in dispatching the zombie with a swift, decisive strike to the back of its head. As Morgan peered through the peephole once more, she noted that the other nearby zombie seemed unperturbed by the commotion. Are we looking good? John inquired, his voice hushed. Super. Let's get this one out of the way and get moving, Morgan replied. John positioned himself once again, and with a decisive motion, Morgan flung open the door allowing John to snatch the remaining creature from the hallway. Like its counterpart, it writhed on the ground before meeting its demise at the hands of John's blade. Quickly retrieving the shield and bat, John assumed his post by the door. Let me do a quick status check, he suggested. Morgan nodded, and she opened the door slightly, allowing John to peek out into the hallway. After a brief survey, he slipped back into the apartment. Okay, we have to be as quiet as we can and make sure this door stays open, John instructed, his voice low but resolute. 
Morgan swiftly walked over to one of the fallen zombies, wrenching a shoe off its foot and placing it beside the door, creating a makeshift barrier to keep it slightly ajar. Okay, let's move. The window should be in the hallway of the third floor, John directed, his voice barely above a whisper. And the stairs? Morgan inquired. Just outside the door on the right, John confirmed. Nodding in understanding, Morgan and John steeled themselves for their next move. With cautious precision, they softly opened the door, sliding the shoe into the gap before gently pulling the door closed behind them. Side by side, they ventured into the hallway. Their attention focused intently on the distant corridor as they slowly backed towards the stairwell, their movements deliberate and silent. As they approached the stairwell, John took the lead. With a steady hand, he pushed open the door, only to encounter resistance after a few feet. In an instant, decaying hands seized the door, their grip cold and clammy against the metal. Without hesitation, John reacted swiftly. Ducking down, he darted inside the stairwell before popping back up, his free arm snaking out to grab hold of the creature. The ghoul lunged forward, its rotting jaws snapping hungrily, but John managed to raise the shield just in time, preventing the creature from closing the distance. Using the momentary reprieve, he swiftly repositioned himself, seizing the back of the zombie's shirt and forcefully shoving it down the stairs, sending it tumbling into the darkness below. Bones cracked ominously throughout the stairwell as the creature plummeted, but John's focus remained steadfast behind him, ensuring no other threats lurked in the shadows. Finally, the zombie came to a halt on the next landing, its movements still erratic despite the evident struggle caused by its broken limbs. Seizing the opportunity, Morgan swiftly shut the door with a quiet click before descending the stairs to deliver the fatal blow to the incapacitated ghoul. As silence settled in the stairwell, they both listened intently for any signs of further danger, relieved when nothing but silence greeted their ears. That was some quick thinking, Morgan complimented, her voice hushed. That's years of football practice. Don't think, just react, John replied modestly, a faint grin playing on his lips. I think that might be the most important thing you ever learned in school," Morgan remarked with a hint of humor. John chuckled in response, gesturing for her to follow as he continued down the stairs. Come on, we're almost to the bodega. Chapter 6 John and Morgan descended the stairs to the third floor, their footsteps echoing through the dimly lit corridor. Pausing at the doorway, John readjusted his sled shield ensuring a firm grip on it as he prepared for what lay beyond. Whatever is on the other side of this door, we're going to have to take care of, John declared. If you hold them off, I'll jab them in the head, Morgan replied. John nodded in agreement, motioning for Morgan to open the door. With a silent countdown, she swung it open, revealing the ominous hallway beyond. Darting through the doorway, John immediately spotted a zombie just outside the door, Without hesitation, he rushed towards it, thrusting the makeshift shield into its path and driving the creature into the wall, effectively pinning it in place. Meanwhile, Morgan sprinted forward, swiftly dispatching the trapped zombie with a knife to the head. As she approached, John scanned the hallway, his eyes narrowing as he spotted half a dozen more creatures slowly making their way towards them. With the immediate threat neutralized, John stood tall, dropping the shield to the ground, much to Morgan's confusion. What are you doing? She asked, her brow furrowed in concern. I'll take care of the hallway. They're spread out, so it's not going to be that difficult, John explained calmly, his gaze fixed on the advancing horde. We can do this together, Morgan insisted. I got this. I need you to start figuring out how we're getting to the roof of the bodega, but more importantly, how in the hell we're getting back up, John replied determination shining in his eyes as he prepared to face the oncoming threat alone. Morgan nodded, her gaze shifting towards the window as John tightened his grip on his bat. With purposeful strides, he made his way down the narrow hallway, occasionally practicing his swing to adjust for the limited space. Approaching the first creature, John halted a few yards away, his bat poised above his head as the zombie lurched towards him. With precise timing, he brought the bat down forcefully, shattering the creature's skull with a sickening crunch. This isn't going to be any big deal, John remarked confidently, his voice echoing down the corridor. As John continued to methodically clear out the hallway, 
Morgan focused her attention on the roof below, estimating the distance of the eight-foot drop. Well, getting down isn't going to be an issue, she observed. After a moment of consideration, Morgan nodded to herself, confidence growing as she formulated a strategy. Should be pretty easy to get back up, especially if we can find a step stool in the store. Yeah, this can work, she concluded. Turning around, Morgan watched with admiration as John effortlessly dispatched the zombies one by one, his movements fluid and efficient. With the last of the undead vanquished, John swaggered back down the hallway, his confidence palpable. Morgan couldn't help but crack a smile at his bravado, offering a mock golf clap as he approached. Nicely done, sir, she praised, her tone light-hearted. Just another day at the office. How are we looking over here? John replied casually. We'll be able to manage it. Worst case, you'll have to give me a boost back up to the window, but I think we can find a stepladder or something in the store, Morgan assured him, her mind already formulating a plan. Okay, if you want to go out first, I can lower you down, John suggested. Morgan nodded in agreement, and the two of them quickly worked together to descend safely to the roof. Once there, they began to search for a way into the second floor of the building, but their efforts proved fruitless. Well, I was kind of hoping for a hatch or something, Morgan remarked. Let's check for the fire escape. Just be as quiet as you can. If those things are away from the store, I'd like to keep it that way, John said. Morgan nodded in agreement as they carefully explored the perimeter of the building, searching for any sign of a fire escape. After a moment, John made a subtle clicking noise to signal her attention. She quickly joined him to spot the fire escape, conveniently located just a few feet from the edge of the roof. Let me borrow a knife from you, John requested, extending his hand towards Morgan. She handed him a knife, watching intently as he adjusted his grip, preparing for what came next. With determination in his eyes, John moved to the edge of the roof, letting his legs dangle over the side. Stay up here until I can get us in, John instructed. I'll wait on your signal, Morgan replied. John hopped down onto the fire escape with practiced silence, his movements fluid as he landed amidst the metal framework. Glancing down, he spotted a throng of zombies milling about on the street below, most of them oblivious to his presence. However, his stealth was short-lived as a pair of decaying arms lunged out from within the building, seizing him in a vice-like grip. Reacting swiftly, John's instincts kicked in, and he began to stab relentlessly through the window. The blade of his knife found its mark repeatedly, puncturing the face of a female zombie already ravaged by decay. With a final jab, he struck true, piercing the creature's eye and penetrating into its brain. As the zombie released its hold and collapsed to the ground, John stood there for a moment, catching his breath and regaining his composure. Looking up to Morgan, who watched with concern from above, he offered a reassuring thumbs up to signal that he was unharmed. John slipped into the second floor apartment, gesturing for Morgan to follow with the remainder of their gear. As he entered, a faint noise caught his attention, emanating from the back bedroom. Ready for action, John gripped his knife tightly, his senses heightened as he cautiously approached the closed door. Glancing back towards Morgan, who was in the midst of climbing through the window, he issued a terse warning. There's movement in here, John informed her, his voice low but urgent. Morgan nodded, swiftly grabbing the shield and positioning herself beside John, ready for whatever was behind the door. With John taking the lead, knife in hand, he approached the closed door cautiously, his movements deliberate. Gently turning the knob, John pulled the door open, revealing a lone creature inside, oblivious to their presence. Catching Morgan's eye, he silently signaled his intent before moving in, his steps silent as he closed the distance between himself and the ghoul, which was fixated on the window. With precision, John drove the blade forcefully into the base of the creature's skull, sending it crumpling to the ground in a lifeless heap. Exhaling a breath he didn't realize he'd been holding, he turned back to Morgan. Okay, that's the easy part down. We have to go clear the store, John said. Morgan nodded in understanding as they approached the front door of the apartment, which opened onto a stairwell descending directly to the bodega on the first floor. Even before they opened the door, the sounds of movement and moaning from below signaled the presence of multiple creatures. Both John and Morgan recognized the threat awaiting them, 
and prepared their weapons for the imminent encounter. With John taking the lead, he was the first to descend the stairs, leading them into a cramped room barely spacious enough for both of them. In the dim light filtering through the small window of the swinging door ahead, John peered into the bodega, observing the significant movement within. Counting silently, he tallied up to six before shaking his head in concern. Turning back to Morgan, he relayed the information through a series of hand signals, indicating the number of zombies they were facing. She offered John the shield, but he waved it off, signaling for her to follow closely. Both of them moved cautiously, staying low as they entered the store, which was lined with five aisles of food stretching down to their left, each reaching about 40 yards. To their right, the front counter housed a small grill and the cash register. The aisle against the back wall appeared empty, but as they approached, they spotted two creatures on the next aisle, about halfway down. John took the lead, motioning for Morgan to follow as he turned down that aisle, keeping low to the ground. However, as they closed in within ten yards, one of the ghouls turned and noticed their presence. It emitted a chilling moan as it lurched towards them. Damn it, John cursed under his breath. Reacting swiftly, John sprang to his feet, charging forward with his knife leading the way. With a quick motion, he grabbed the ghoul by the shirt, immobilizing it before driving the blade forcefully into its face. The knife punctured the skull with a sickening crunch, ensuring the creature was dispatched. But before he could release his grip, the momentum of the zombie behind it sent the fallen ghoul crashing into John, knocking them both to the ground in a tangled heap. Seizing the opportunity to assist, Morgan stepped forward, wielding the bat with one hand as she swung downward towards the approaching zombie. However, her aim was slightly off, and the bat glanced off the creature's head, striking its shoulder instead with a resounding crack. The force of Morgan's blow was enough to send the zombie stumbling backward, crashing into the shelves laden with food. Despite the momentary disruption, the creature swiftly regained its footing, its attention now fixated on Morgan. Reacting quickly, she raised her sled shield, advancing towards the zombie and driving it forcefully into the creature's chest, propelling it back into the shelves with a grunt of effort. I need some help. Morgan called out urgently. Meanwhile, John managed to free himself from the weight of the dead ghoul, sliding back on the ground before swiftly rising to his feet. With precision, he rammed the tip of his knife into the zombie's head, silencing it once and for all. Are you good? Morgan inquired. Yeah, I just need a shower, John replied with a smirk. Morgan's laughter was abruptly silenced by the ominous sounds of moaning and movement emanating from behind them. Turning, they spotted the other four zombies rounding the aisle, slowly making their way towards them. Let me have the shield, John requested, his voice calm but determined. Quickly swapping weapons, they found themselves with the zombies still about ten yards away, giving them a brief window of opportunity as they slowly backed up, buying themselves a few precious moments to strategize. I'll hold them up. You knock them down, John instructed, his gaze focused on the approaching threat. With a nod, Morgan brandished the knives, a determined smile crossing her face as she prepared to follow John's lead. After you, she replied confidently. Taking the lead once more, John charged forward, stopping a few yards away from the first creature, which was slightly ahead of the others. Crouching low, he extended the shield, bracing himself for the impending onslaught. Patiently, he waited for the zombie to draw closer, its movements erratic as it stumbled towards him. As it nearly walked directly into the shield, John held it firmly in place, effectively immobilizing the creature. Despite its thrashing, Morgan moved in, delivering a killing blow from above the shield. Three more, John announced. John shoved the ghoul aside, as they both took a few steps back, ensuring the aisle directly in front of them was clear. Patiently, they waited for the next zombie to reach them. Over the next few minutes, they repeated this process, easily dispatching the zombies that lurked in the bodega. With the room finally devoid of enemy movements, they stood there, catching their breath. I gotta say, this whole process goes a lot smoother with a partner, Morgan remarked. Yeah, even with Elliot having a broken foot, it was pretty easy to clear out the hallways of our building. Even when they were fast, John agreed. I'm still surprised I survived my first encounter with one of those sprinters. I opened the door of the apartment, and that thing came at me like a bat out of hell. 
Morgan reminisced. How did you take it out? If you don't mind me asking, John inquired. Dumb luck, really. I was barely awake, no coffee or anything. I just heard a noise in the hallway and stupidly went to investigate. When I opened the door, all I saw was a blur running at me, so I darted out of the way and tried to slam the door shut. The damn thing got into the apartment, but the door clipped its foot. It fell headfirst into the wall and broke its neck, Morgan recounted with a hint of disbelief. And let me guess, it didn't kill it. John guessed, already familiar with the resilience of the undead. Nope. It didn't cry out in pain, didn't do anything except try to get up and come after me. I tried calling 911, but that went nowhere. It didn't take me long to figure out the world had gone to hell, Morgan explained, her tone tinged with resignation. Here's to being lucky, John remarked, raising an imaginary toast to their survival. You know it. And speaking of lucky, let's see how lucky we get with the store inventory, Morgan suggested optimistically. I'll get us a basket, John replied with a chuckle, both of them sharing a moment of relief as they began to take inventory of the store, grateful that the shelves appeared to be well stocked. Chapter 7 Morgan and John meticulously combed through the store, jotting down their findings as they progressed. After nearly an hour of diligent work, they concluded their inventory task and reconvened at the checkout counter to compare their notes. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling pretty good about our findings, Morgan remarked confidently. I think we might be set for a while. Based on what I've got on my list, and if we ration properly, we should be able to stretch our supplies out for a couple of weeks among the group, John replied, sharing Morgan's optimism. Combined with mine, we should be covered for at least a month, Morgan added. Now we just have to haul it all back to the apartments, John said. It shouldn't be too difficult. The route's clear for us, it's just a matter of getting there. Morgan assured him. Speaking of which, did you happen to find a step ladder? John inquired. No luck there. I'll have a look behind the counter, Morgan responded before heading off in search of the item. And maybe some sturdy bags too, John suggested as an afterthought. Nodding in agreement, Morgan went about her search, while John ventured toward the front door. He noticed it was securely locked with a metal bar across it, but lacked any additional barricade. Peering outside, he observed the street teeming with zombies, albeit spread out in small groups, none larger than three within a few yards of each other. Even spaced out like that, I wouldn't risk trying to navigate through them, John muttered to himself. Just then, Morgan's voice broke his reverie. Hey John, while they may not have sold liquor here, the owner certainly seemed to enjoy it. Found us a bottle behind the counter. Definitely taking that with us, John replied with a hint of satisfaction. Morgan chuckled nervously as she continued her search, while John's attention snapped back to the street. His eyes widened in alarm as he spotted a zombie police officer shuffling past. Morgan, come here quick, John called out urgently. Morgan halted her task, rushing over to John's side, her heart racing with apprehension. What's wrong? she asked. Look, it's a police officer, John exclaimed. I offer to buy you a drink, and you immediately rat me out. Not cool, man, Morgan retorted, attempting to lighten the tense atmosphere with a joke. No, seriously. Look at his belt, John insisted. Morgan examined the zombie officer more closely, noticing that his belt remained intact, with the gun and spare ammunition securely in their holsters, and the radio still hanging from it. Yeah, having that gun would be useful, but he's out there, and we're in here, Morgan remarked. I'm not concerned about the gun, but we could really use that two-way radio, John countered. It's a pipe dream, John. There's no way in hell we're opening those doors. Even if you got to him, there's no way you'd be able to get the belt off of him before you're swarmed. Those other things are too close to him, Morgan argued. That's why we're going to do it in here. Snatch and grab, just like the apartment, John declared. Morgan hesitated, her head still shaking in disbelief. It's too dangerous, she murmured. John countered, his tone firm. Nobody in our building had a two-way radio. We need to know if someone is still out there because if they are, they need to know we're alive. Despite John's reasoning, Morgan remained uncertain. 
Yeah, it's a risk, but it's worth taking, John insisted. And you know I'm right. And what if we get the radio and there's nobody on the other end? Morgan asked. Then we'll have confirmation that we're truly on our own, John replied calmly, and we can plan accordingly. After a moment of contemplation, Morgan relented. Snatch and grab, and you better move like those college scouts are watching you on the football field, she conceded. Oh, I plan on it, John affirmed. Come on, we have to do this now. This is a bad idea, Morgan muttered. Don't think, just react. We got this, John reassured her. Now get that door. Morgan nodded and hurried over to the door, carefully removing the metal bar to minimize noise. With her hand on the deadbolt, she prepared to open it. Meanwhile, John positioned himself beside the door, peering out onto the street. About eight feet away from the front door, a policeman zombie lurked on the sidewalk. Another zombie stood directly between John and the officer, with a horde of about a dozen zombies scattered within five yards beyond them. John took a deep breath, steadying himself before issuing the signal. Go now, he commanded. As Morgan flipped the deadbolt, its metallic thunk echoed, alerting the nearby zombies, including the police officer. She flung open the door, and John dashed through with lightning speed. On the sidewalk, John targeted the nearest zombie, pushing it forcefully to the side, causing it to crash to the ground. The surrounding zombies, attracted by the commotion, emitted excited moans at the prospect of fresh prey. Undeterred, John charged straight for the police officer, who reached out for him. With swift agility, John deflected the officer's grasping arms, as though confronting an offensive lineman, enabling him to slip past and get into the creature's body. John exerted his strength, spinning the creature around and forcefully propelling it towards the bodega door. However, his push was too vigorous, causing the zombie to stagger forward and collapse just a few feet shy of the doorway. Forget it, just get in here. Morgan's urgent plea went unheeded as John pressed on, lunging forward to seize the zombie by its wrist in passing. With a firm grip, he pulled the thrashing and flailing creature towards the threshold, straining against its resistance with every ounce of his strength. With mounting horror, Morgan watched as the zombies outside closed in on them. Hurry, she yelled. John exerted every ounce of strength, hauling the creature through the doorway before giving it a final shove to ensure it stayed down. Meanwhile, Morgan struggled to close the door, but a persistent zombie managed to thrust its arm through the narrowing gap, thwarting her efforts. Together, they pushed against the door, straining to keep the relentless undead at bay, but their resistance was faltering. Taking charge, John planted his feet firmly and braced his shoulder against the door, preparing to defend their refuge. With authority in his voice, he barked out orders. Get the bat. Morgan nodded in acknowledgement and broke away from the door, leaving John to fend off the encroaching horde alone. He strained, but managed to maintain his position, holding the door in place against the pressing mass of zombies. As Morgan hurried to retrieve the weapon, lying halfway up the store, John pivoted his attention back to the police officer, who was starting to rise once more. Morgan. John yelled. Morgan raced down the aisle, the bat gripped tightly in her hands. As she approached, she swung the bat with force, connecting solidly with the officer's face and sending it crashing back to the ground. Without hesitation, she delivered a decisive blow, ensuring the threat was neutralized before turning her attention back to the door. To get that thing out of the doorway. John instructed. Morgan nodded and hurried to the widening crack in the door where the relentless pressure from the ghouls outside threatened to breach their sanctuary. She extended the weapon, using the tip of the bat to push back the encroaching zombie. After a few forceful shoves, the zombie lost its balance, retracting its arm from the opening, allowing John to forcefully slam the door shut. Despite his best efforts, the weight of the mob continued to exert pressure, causing the door to creak slightly open. Morgan gripped the deadbolt, her fingers trembling as she struggled to flick it shut, while John pushed against the relentless force outside. Finally, with a satisfying click, the deadbolt engaged, securing the door against the onslaught. Despite the lock, John persisted in bracing himself against the door as Morgan grabbed the metal bar from the ground, sliding it into place with a resounding clack, fully securing the entrance. Once the door was sealed, John slumped to the ground, exhaustion weighing heavily upon him. 
He gasped for breath, his chest heaving as he attempted to speak through the fatigue that gripped him. Hey, Morgan, John began. Yeah, John? Morgan responded, turning to face him. Can you do me a favor? John continued. And what would that be? Morgan inquired. If I ever have another questionable idea about anything, I want you to remind me about this moment, John requested, a wry smile tugging at the corners of his lips. Morgan chuckled softly, patting John on the shoulder reassuringly. Oh, you can count on that. John returned her smile, albeit with a hint of weariness, as Morgan helped him up from the ground. Together, they approached the motionless police officer lying on the floor. Just to be sure, John took the bat and delivered another forceful blow to the head. Okay, let's see what we got, John declared. John retrieved the radio while Morgan relieved the officer of his belt, acquiring the gun and ammunition. With a steadying breath, John clicked the radio button and spoke into it. Hello, is anybody there? He called out, his voice echoing through the static-filled air. There was a brief moment of anticipation, followed by a faint voice that faded away as the battery on the device died. Oh, what the hell? John exclaimed in frustration. No, I heard somebody. I know I did. Morgan, sensing John's frustration, stepped in to investigate. She took the radio from him, adjusting the dials and inspecting the battery compartment. What are you doing? John questioned, watching her movements with curiosity. Sometimes it's just a bad connection. I'm just making sure, Morgan replied, her focus intent as she checked the batteries. Despite her efforts, the radio remained silent and unresponsive. Damn it. It's no use, Morgan conceded. John grinned slyly as he removed one of the oversized batteries from the radio, resembling a giant-sized AA battery. What are you so happy about? Morgan asked, intrigued by his expression. I have batteries like this back at the apartment, John explained, excitement creeping into his voice. They went into one of those super bright flashlights where you can see the light for a mile. Why in the world would you need one of those in the city? Morgan questioned. The snowstorm last year that knocked out power for a couple of days, John recounted. My old man didn't like sitting in the dark, so he picked some up. That thing will light up a room like the sun is sitting in the recliner. Are the batteries charged? Morgan inquired. One set should be. But more importantly, I have a charger, John replied. But there's no power, Morgan said. Just like there's no power during a blackout, John retorted. My old man really didn't like sitting in the dark, so he sprang for the solar-powered battery charger. So when we get this voice back, we're not going to lose it again. Morgan couldn't help but chuckle at the thought. Nothing like doing a little panic buying after a mild inconvenience. Both of them shared a moment of laughter as they thoroughly searched the officer for anything else that might be of use. Aside from his badge, which Morgan pocketed, they found nothing else. You want to be a police officer now? John teased, raising an eyebrow at Morgan. You never know when it may come in handy, Morgan replied with a smirk. Okay, Officer Morgan, John playfully conceded. They shared another chuckle as they made their way to the front counter. Morgan scoured the area before finding what she was looking for. There we go, she declared, pulling out a small step stool and setting it on the counter. Now we're talking. Now we just need the bags and we're in good shape, John said. Despite their efforts, all Morgan could find were brown paper bags. That's not going to do us much good. We need something with handles, she said. John pondered for a moment before heading back to the door, grabbing a handful of baskets and returning to the counter. We're looting the place, so I don't think they'll mind if we take these too, John quipped, his grin widening as he glanced at Morgan. Morgan flashed the badge with a smirk. Are you admitting to theft, young man? John simply laughed and shook his head before handing her a basket. Come on, officer, we have some shopping to do. Chapter 8 The sun dipped low on the horizon as John, Morgan, and Lily trudged across the rooftop, burdened by bags and containers from the nearby bodega. 
Their movements were sluggish, each trip marking another arduous journey between their apartments and the store. Passing supplies through the window to Leon, their neighbor, they were interrupted by Elliot's voice from above. Is that the last of it? Elliot called down from the fourth floor window. The last we're getting tonight, John replied wearily. There's still a couple boxes of canned goods sitting behind the counter, but we just don't have the energy for it tonight. Besides, they're not going anywhere, Morgan chimed in. That's for the best Leon interjected. Because Miss Donna said dinner is going to be on in ten. John exchanged a concerned glance with Leon, prompting the latter to explain further. I know we have to ration, but you had some fresh ingredients in the hall that were on their last legs. So she whipped up something with those. Okay, but no more big meals after this. The power's out, so keeping leftovers cold isn't an option, John said. Leon accepted the last basket from Lily with a nod. Okay, but you're telling her, he insisted. I'm not breaking that sweet old woman's heart by telling her she can't cook anymore. John wanted to respond but simply lowered his head in resignation. Yeah, well that's tomorrow's problem, he muttered. Come on, let's get cleaned up for dinner. Lily chimed in, come on, Morgan. I'm pretty sure I have some clean clothes that should fit you. We'll see you at Miss Donna's in a few minutes, Morgan replied. And don't forget those batteries. John nodded as he retreated into his apartment, his exhaustion palpable. Collapsing into a chair, he surveyed the room and his gaze settled on a photo of him with his parents hanging on the wall. I really wish you guys were here, he murmured, addressing the image. But even if you're not, I hope that you're looking down from above and are proud of the man you raised. I feel like I did a lot of good today. After a moment, he chuckled to himself and shook his head. I'm talking to a photo, he said, amused. I really need a good meal because I think the malnourishment is starting to mess with my head. After changing into clean clothes, John approached the solar-powered charger resting on the table beside the window. With the sunlight just grazing it, he picked it up and inspected it. 70% power. That's good enough for right now, he mused. We'll get them a full charge tomorrow. Assuming someone is on the other end, that is. Pocketing the batteries, John made his way down to Miss Donna's place. As he approached, he encountered Lily exiting, carrying a plate of food. Where are you going? He inquired. We caused quite the scene today, and there are a lot more of those things on the street, Lily explained. So I'm going to set up in the lobby to eat and keep an eye on things. John noticed a book in her hand beneath the plate. You just want to be left alone and read, don't you? He teased. It's nothing personal, John. I'm just introverted, Lily replied. You were a bartender, John pointed out. The fear of starvation outweighed my desire to not be around people. Plus, that bodega owner had a nice selection of books in his apartment, so I helped myself to a few, Lily explained. Well, have fun, Lily. John said. If Miss Donna whips out a hidden dessert, I'll bring you some down. I appreciate that, John. And if anybody shows up on the other end of that radio. Lily trailed off. I'll come down and tell you too, John assured her. Lily nodded as she turned and walked away, leaving John to enter Miss Donna's place. Inside, he found everyone already gathered around the table, where serving dishes brimmed with freshly cooked veggies, potatoes, and biscuits. There you are, John. Sit down and eat before it gets cold, Miss Donna exclaimed warmly. I will, Miss Donna. I just need to put the batteries in the radio, John replied, grabbing the device from the counter and inserting the batteries. As he turned it on, intending to test it before dinner, he was stunned to hear a voice on the other end. It was a middle-aged man's voice, robust and authoritative. Of the New York City Emergency Management Department, is there anybody there? The voice crackled through the radio. Frozen, John hesitated before responding. Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, thank the sweet baby Jesus, you're real. The voice exclaimed with relief. I swear I heard a voice hours ago, but since nobody was responding, I was starting to believe I was going crazy. What the hell happened? The batteries on the radio were drained, John explained. Yeah, these things are grade A bullshit, the man grumbled. But at least some politician got a nice kickback from a supplier, so at least it wasn't all for nothing. That's true, I suppose. 
but if you don't mind me asking, who are we talking to? John inquired. My apologies, my name is Carl, and I'm with the New York City Emergency Management Department. And you are? Carl asked. I'm John, and I'm here with five others. We're in an apartment building in Brooklyn, John replied. Brooklyn, huh? It's good to see there are some signs of life over there, Carl remarked. There's not much on our block, unfortunately. It's a mess down here, John admitted. Hey, you should thank your lucky stars you're in Brooklyn. I still have video feeds from there, and it's a walk in the park compared to Manhattan. You want to talk about getting bent over a barrel. Manhattan sure did, and there's a line forming around the block, Carl quipped. That's colorful, John commented, taken aback. Yeah, sorry, I've been locked up in here for the last week all alone, so my filter has all but fallen by the wayside, Carl chuckled sheepishly. John glanced up from the radio, noticing Morgan and the others gesturing for him to join them at the table. Carl, I'm going to put you on the table now so the others can ask questions. If you have the time, that is, John informed Carl. You have at it, John. I have nothing but time, Carl responded. Placing the radio in the center of the table, John waited for someone to speak up, but the room fell silent. Well, don't everybody talk at once, Carl joked. Sorry, Carl, Morgan apologized, breaking the silence. Now, who do we have here? My name's Morgan, and I was wondering what you could tell us about what's going on. Morgan inquired. I'm guessing you want something more specific than the world's gone to shit. Carl remarked wryly. A little more detail would be good, Morgan replied. Well, let me go ahead and rip this band-aid off. Nobody is coming to save us, Carl stated bluntly, causing a collective drop in the room's mood. Yeah, that's about the reaction I was expecting, Carl observed. So this is happening everywhere? Leon questioned. As far as I can tell. Well, it's happening everywhere in America, which is all I really care about since that's where my fat ass currently resides. Carl replied. What has the government said about this? Elliot inquired. Absolutely nothing, at least not to me. It's like they've completely written off New York, leaving us to fend for ourselves. And believe me, I tried getting in touch with anybody, and it's radio silence, Carl explained. Or maybe they know we're tougher than any other city on the face of the planet and can handle whatever is thrown at us. So they're off helping the weaker cities, John suggested. Carl let out a hearty laugh before responding. I know I just met you, John, but I can already tell I'm going to like you, he remarked. Carl, it's Morgan again. Have you found any other survivors in the city besides us? Morgan asked. Yeah, a few here and there. I spotted a few survivors on the cameras I have access to yesterday. They looked like they were pretty fortified inside a grocery store. And I talked to a couple of guys out in the river, just hanging out in their boats, Carl answered. John's excitement was palpable at the news. People have boats? Everyone at the table shook their heads in response. Yeah, there are boats, but from what I'm seeing on the cameras, unless you're already at Coney Island, you aren't going to make it to the water, Carl explained. Exactly how many cameras do you have, Carl? Elliot inquired. About a thousand, give or take. They're mostly around government buildings and high-value targets, so I don't have a complete view of the city. But I can see enough, Carl elaborated. So Carl, what are we supposed to do? Morgan pressed. Smoke them if you got them, Carl quipped. I was hoping for something a little more substantial than that, Morgan retorted. Okay, you're supposed to do the only thing you can do, which is sit tight for as long as you can. How much food do you guys have, Carl asked. Enough to last us a few weeks, John replied. Okay, let's start with that. If you have a calendar, circle the date two weeks from now. If nobody from the outside has reached out, we'll start figuring it out for ourselves, Carl suggested. That sounds like a plan, Carl, Morgan agreed. Good. Now I'm at my post 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you need anything, I want you to reach out, Carl instructed. And likewise, Carl. We'll have someone monitoring the radio, John assured him. No, no, don't go burning battery power on my account, Carl replied. I've got a solar battery charger, Carl. You're good. 
So if you need a chat or want to play some quiz games to pass the time, we got you covered, John reassured him. That's mighty kind of you, John. Okay, folks, I've taken up enough of your time for the moment. I'll be in touch when I have something, Carl concluded. Be safe, Carl, Morgan said. The line went dead, leaving the group in stunned silence. So we really are on our own, aren't we? Elliot remarked somberly. It would appear that way, Leon confirmed. Well, there ain't anything we can do about that right now. However, we can dive into this meal while it's still got some warmth on it. Now, no talking about the outside. If you open your mouth, it better be to put food in it or tell us something fun. Now dig in, Miss Donna declared. Everyone around the table nodded in compliance before eagerly digging into the meal. Despite their best efforts to focus on the wonderful home-cooked food Miss Donna had provided, they all shared the same lingering thought in the back of their minds. Nobody was coming to save them. The end.